Right. So you you didn't you didn't miss part one. <laughs> so this is a, a session in its own right. So so how many of you today are using Azure? Two hands, or one and a half actually. So that was a non-committal. Oh, there's a little another one. So maybe two and a half, or maybe we should just say two. Okay, so the, the idea of this session is to really look at what we have to do in terms of IT Pro support for Azure and, and what Azure gives us or gives an organization potentially. Um, and that, that's why I originally wrote this um, to do, was actually to really show that actually as IT Pros, even the things in the cloud, we still have pretty much the same job as we do today. There are things that are different, but uh, the really important stuff remains the same. And it also gives us real potential to add extra value to an organization. So I'm going to look at, first of all, sort of the, the IT roles and challenges. We're going to look at an introduction to the cloud. Um, Azure fundamentals, so exactly you know, what's in Azure, what's available to us. Um, building and deploying a Windows Azure uh, service and an application into that. I'm not actually going to go through building code. I'm going to work from the assumption that you know, the developers handed you the code and what you do to actually deploy it, get it up there, check it's healthy, and manage it. And then uh, looking at connecting on-premise and cloud systems. And then finally, we're just managing, um, I'm just going to briefly mention the fact that we've got Windows Azure Access Control Service, but I did a, quite a lot in uh, my session on identity for the cloud for that. Okay, so if we look at on-premise computing, um, you've got, uh, it requires your hardware, space, electricity, cooling. And quite often I, I work with organizations and they, you know, they've got extra racks, but they've run out of cooling or they've run out of power. Right. And then other organizations have got no rack space. And then another organization I'm working with, a very big organization, one of their data centers, uh, they suddenly realized they only had a few gigs of storage space left. Right. And they needed to onboard another project. Um, you've got to manage the OS, the applications, all those updates that you love doing. Software licensing is an issue. Difficult to scale. You've either got too much capacity or too little capacity. And then it's very difficult to be agile, to move quickly. All right? Everything takes a long time. You need a new server. You know, there's a, you've got to fill in the appropriate requisition. There's a lead time to getting it and so on. Um, high upfront costs. You've, you, know, you decide to go for a new project. You've got to allocate the budget to build out the infrastructure to support that project. And you have complete control, obviously, but you also have complete responsibility. And uh, one of the other things is, I, I haven't got on that slide, and I keep meaning to add, is you have a requirement to have a green policy. Well, you can sort of apply it to the electricity and the cooling, but you've also, when you need to get rid of your servers, how do you actually get rid of them? Right, you've actually got to pay money to have them taken away from you. So. <coughs> What do IT pros do? Um, you install the subware hardware. How many of you like installing racks? No one? How long, how, oh, one person at the back. Yeah, it can be quite fun, can't it? What about cabling? Yep, OK, only one person admitting to that. Uh, you configure the network, uh, install the OS, and then forever update, 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 update. And manage storage and backup is going to be an important role, making sure you know, if you're working with, with uh, SQL databases, defining schemas, making sure that the database has been deployed correctly, it's clustered, and then managing the backups. Apply security, obviously. Uh, certificate management as well. Uh, deploy applications. You uh, monitor applications and the OS health and performance. And then you're meant to be matching the requirements that are defined for you for the business requirements. So if you deploy something, you've got to make sure that it's performant and matching those business requirements. What's the IT pro's perception of developers? Quite often it's, hey, deploy this. And you then are responsible for deploying it. They may give you a huge sheet telling you how to deploy it. The problem is it's probably got typos in it. 
And then when you start deploying, if you're deploying it across you know, a multi-instance web farm of some kind, what normally happens is the first one gets almost deployed as it's specified. The next one, people remember things, and it's deployed. It's like Chinese whispers going across the front-end web service. So managing demand is always a tricky one. So you come up with this new brilliant idea of selling Hoochie Coochie 2010 widgets. Right? And someone says, well, how many are you going to sell? Oh, we're going to sell 100,000 in the first week. You know, next week it's 200,000. Next week it's 300,000. And someone has to figure out what demand is. Well, the easiest way is just to draw a straight line. And then what actually happens is you then decide that you are going to support the service from day one up to a certain time. And that is the compute capacity you need, and that is your entry cost. Right? So that's that upfront cost there. And then the reality is something like this happens over time. And you, you pretty much say, hey, look, we need to scale up. So you scale up at this point, but you actually don't quite scale up properly because suddenly you really are selling Hoochie Coochie 2000 widgets. And then what actually happens is you end up with a situation where you're under capacity. And what do people do when you're under capacity? They don't bother coming to your website again. So suddenly the whole thing tails off. So you started off, you were under capacity, and then you've got wasted capacity. Sorry, you started off, you were over capacity to begin with, which you have to be. You've got wasted capacity to begin with, and then you've got this horrible waste going on because you know, suddenly sales have dropped. This is a very, very tricky one to deal with. Uh, very typical of a event selling website. And you know, the, the events websites for the Olympics in the UK have certainly suffered from this one. So you've got you know, people browsing the website and then ticket sales open. So how do you forecast your capacity? Well, somebody draws a line at some point and says, that's what we're going to go for. And you end up with these little peaks up here, which are referred to as CLMs. Anyone come across a CLM before? They're career-limiting moments. So this is the point where you are being absolutely screamed at, all right? Because everyone is complaining. And in terms of the, the Olympics website, it's in the national press. You know, and they're having to change things to, to uh, satisfy customers. So if you've got a typical application, you start off in, in a sort of very simplistic model. You have a web layer, you have a business layer, you might have some back-end storage of some kind. And when you suddenly get a huge demand at the front end, it all starts to overheat. So what do you do? You will then scale up and you'll scale out. So you might increase the front end web servers. You've got to deal with the load balancing. You might in increase the back end business layer. Again, load balancing across there. And the question is, how much is it going to cost you? Right? And it's capital cost. You can expend it. Suddenly, you've got this huge capacity now. And you suddenly discover that the sales just dropped off. So you've got a lot of wasted capacity there. And typically, is how long is it going to take you take you to actually get there? Right? So if I said to you, how, I need a SQL cluster. Right? How many days would it take you to put a SQL cluster together? And I'm talking about production ready. Anyone has it a guess? You've got to buy the servers. 5, 10, 15, 20 days, something like that. You've got, it's going to be a substantial lead time to actually make these changes. So if we look at public cloud computing, what you actually end up with is you end up with on-demand compute and storage capacity. So if you need more compute power, you ramp it up. You've, it's internet-based, so you're going to connect to it through across the internet. And that may well be what you want. You want your customers coming in over the internet. But if you publish a, a service that you've currently got on-premise into the cloud, remember that it will be accessible from the internet. 
And what you find is a lot of people who've got their applications running within their corporate network, nicely secured within their boundary, those applications may not have been written with a good security development life cycle. So the code may not be very good. So be very careful about just say, taking an app and pushing it up into public cloud. You pay for what you use, which is a very good way of working. The other thing is to be very, very aware, it's delivered as a service, all right? So you are probably not going to be able to change that service. If you don't like something, you need to go to a different provider and find a provider that gives you what you need. So very, very important is the SLAs. Uh, and do look at them very carefully, because some SLAs are written in a, a very strange way. So you might, you might find, you know, we've got an SLA, it's 99.95 uptime. And then there's a definition of downtime. And downtime is 10 consecutive minutes of unavailability. Right? So you could be down for 10 minutes, it doesn't count against the SLA. So you could be down for 9.9 .9 seconds, up for half a second, down for 9.9, .9, up for half a second, down for 9.9, .9, and the SLA is great. You've still got 99.95 availability. So be very, very careful about reading the SLAs when you're going to the cloud. And you also, if you, if it's the SLAs are tend to be very different to the way that you might have normal SLAs. So it's very important that you get involved, the techies get involved, to actually really understand what they're saying in the, the service level agreements. Okay, so in terms of cloud, cloud offerings, if we compare them with on-premise, on-premise you have a complete control, you have complete responsibility. You've then got the ability to have infrastructure as a service, or IaaS, and IaaS Basically, it gives you a virtualized instance. You're responsible for the operating system and everything else. So all the patching, putting the necessary frameworks on to support your applications. So that's the infrastructure service. If you look at platform as a service, what you do is you run applications on a platform that has already been looked after for you. So all you are doing is deploying apps. And if you look at the different platforms and service offerings in the cloud, you'll find that you, may, you can't just take an on-premise app and just necessarily push it straight into the cloud. You may have to craft that app to run in the appropriate framework. So today, if you take an app that's on-premise and you want to push it into the Azure cloud, you have to change that app to support it within Azure. And then you've got software as a service, and software as a service, everything is looked after by the cloud provider. And so it's I, IaaS, PaaS, and SaaS. And there's another one which is so which you may may have not heard of, which is MaaS. And MaaS is the one that uh, it's for IT pros that don't adopt the cloud, and it's my ass. But um, anyway. <laughs> That's coming later. So Office 365 fits in here. Uh, Azure today fits in here. But in an upcoming release, uh, it will become available as a platform, as a service. And I can't say very much about that because it's all under NDA at the moment. But in the next few months, what you'll see is a, a refresh of Azure. And uh, there's one very significant change. Well, there's actually a lot of significant changes, but one in terms of supporting applications straight from on-premise and in the cloud. And I'll just talk a little bit more detail of that later on. So what does the Azure platform look like? So you have a management uh, layer, and the management layer you can access through a portal. You can equally well access it through APIs. So you can run PowerShell to deploy your applications into Azure, do your monitoring, and so on. Uh, you can deploy the apps through the web portal as well. You have compute, you have storage, and then you have SQL Azure. And SQL Azure is very, very similar to on-premise Azure. So there's a few differences. You've also got SQL reporting service. So if you needed a highly available SQL database, uh, once you've done it once, you can pretty much have it up and running within, within sort of less than half an hour. Right, so someone sort of in a meeting says, oh yeah, we need a fully clustered SQL database. Half an hour, please, and you've got it. Right, so it's, it, you can move that quickly. 
And then, so in under compute, what we have is we have web roles, and web roles, if you like, think of them as IIS, all right? So the users connect into a web role. Uh, you then have the capability of having worker roles, and worker roles are sort of number crunching roles, if you like. They're just raw compute. So you could have a web role with worker role behind it, or you could actually have a web role which talks directly to storage. So you don't necessarily need web roles. And then you have VM roles, and again, I'll talk about those shortly. In terms of storage, we have blobs, tables, and queues. Again, we'll see how those are used. And then you have this thing called the Windows Azure App Fabric, and the App Fabric is sort of building blocks for bringing all these distributed systems together. So there's the access control service, there's the, um, the there's caching, there's network connectivity, so we can actually connect on-premise to the cloud, so we've got a VPN capability there as well. Um, lots of words, so I call it the, the Azure spaghetti, and what I want to do in, in this session is try and demystify some of those, so at least when you start talking about Azure with your company, and it's very, very important you get involved in an early days, because ultimately, it's an application that is running in the cloud, and just think of the cloud as an extension of your infrastructure. So you're consuming a cloud service, but it is part of your real estate, effectively, in terms of your domain as IT Pro. So you're going to be looking after it. Um, so first of all, what we do is we need a subscription to Azure, and you can get a free trial subscription. So you get 30 days free trial to Azure itself. And also, have a look, if you've got MSDN in the organization, so if you've got MS, Microsoft uh, a Developers Network subscription, it actually comes with an Azure uh, capability. And it's quite interesting, actually, if you add up the cost of Azure against what you get in the subscription, it almost makes the subscription free. So it's another way of getting it. So in terms of roles, what we have is we have worker roles, and the worker role, we have a number of instances. So think of an instance as a clonable entity. Right? So we could have zero, one, just one instance, or we could have multiple instances going up there. Network load balancing, automatically taken care of. Right? And an instance is literally a copy of the other one. So they are stateless. And that's very important to realize. So an instance is completely stateless. So if you write something to disk and that role has to be restarted, right? well, if you restart it, it's fine. It'll still use the same disk. But if it gets re-imaged for some reason, so this instance is running somewhere in the Azure data center, that server crashes and it needs to be moved to another one, it will be re-imaged at that point. And anything you wrote to disk on that one has now vanished. Right? So you, you only cache on those instances. So scale up, scale down. You've then got the concept of a worker role. So this guy connects to, to the internet. The worker role could do some number crunching. and I've shown there the worker role connected to the database, but there's nothing to stop the web role connecting directly to the database. So you don't need one of these guys. You just need those if you, if you design the application and you want to do lots of compute. How do we communicate between these two? Uh, it uses what's referred to as queues and tables. You remember I mentioned the storage. There were blobs, queues, and tables. Okay. A blob, just think of it as it's a binary large object. It's like a file system. So you can store anything you like in a blob. Uh, with a queue, what we do is we drop something in a queue, and then it's used as a communication path to the worker role. So the worker role picks out of the queue, does its work. It needs somewhere to put the results, and it puts the results into a, a table. So. Here, we've got lots of instances in the front end in the web role dropping into the queue, and then the uh, messages are being picked up, passed by the worker roles, and you can have all of these instances will be hooked on the same queue. So you've got more instances, the queue's going to empty quicker. 
right? And if you, if you think about it, it's it's very very similar to the sort of Starbucks style, ca you know, um, cafe. So you come in to a Starbucks, and what they do, they take your money at the front end and your order, they write it on a cup, they put it down, and then somebody over here at the machine picks it up and makes your you know frappuccino or whatever you want, right? So that's gone into the queue, and then they put it on a table for you to pick up. Right? So it's a very similar concept. If you suddenly have a whole bunch of people coming into the store, and somebody will be taking the money at the front end and taking the orders. If you need more people, you bring more people out from the back to deal with that. And then if you've got lots and lots of coffee cups that need making, you bring more people onto making the coffee cups and the drinks. So you scale up at both sides. You pay per role instance. And you can add and remove instances on demand. They're very, very easy to do. You can do them through PowerShell. You can do them also um, uh, you could actually uh, do them through the portal. Right? Uh, Microsoft doesn't do automatic on-demand scaling at the moment. Well, actually, if you think about it, it'd be very difficult to know what you consider as the need for scaling. It could be that the queue's filling up. It could be that the people at the front end are getting slow response time. You need to decide when you need to scale. Right? And the other thing, it would be a little bit suspicious if Microsoft automatically scaled for you because it's pay as you go. So they say, oh yeah, we scaled you up to 40 instances last night. That'll be another, oh, you know. So that's, um, it's up to you to, to scale this thing. And then in terms of the, the compute model, the idea of the compute model is that you could have, let's say you, you had this application that, I don't know, did financial modeling, right? And you need to put a few figures in the front end, which you do over here and then it gets passed through the back end and they sit there number crunching for you and then giving you back the results. Thing is, if you want um, the SLA, which is 99.95, .95, then what you need is a minimum of two instances. All right, so you need two instances in there to actually get the SLA that you need. Instance size. So you can have extra small, you can have small, medium, large, extra large, you decide. And it gives you the, the, the CPU, the number of cores that you've got, the memory in your, your actual instance, the instance storage that's available locally, and, and uh, in terms of I.O. performance is over there. So <coughs> each instance, very importantly, is it's in, deployed in its own virtual machine. This is run by the Azure Fabric. Okay, so you end up, an instance is inside a VM. Right? So if you deploy five instances up to Azure, right, as soon as you've deployed them, even if they're not running, it's pay as you go. Right? So I've seen people shut down their instances and say, oh, well, they're not running, we're not going to be charged. You are. Right? So if you only want one instance up there, just have one. Don't shut instances down. You still get charged if they're up there but not running because each one is deployed onto a virtual machine and it's therefore reserved. Okay. Um, the cost also is, is charged on the instance size that you select and be very careful if you get a, a free subscription it will probably come with an instance size. All right, so I particularly remember this with um, so, some time ago I um, with Azure, when I first started using it, uh, I, I sort of, uh, it was through the MSDN subscription, and uh, I thought, oh, I'll use extra small, it'll be cheaper, and I'll get more time on it. And actually, MSDN subscription gave me a small instance, and by using extra small, I was actually charged for it. So be very careful on the charging model as well. So the VM role today, what is it? It's rather strange. You think. When, when the VM role first came out, everyone went, yes, infrastructure as a service. And then you sort of started to look at it. Is it a true VM as we know and love? Uh, no, because it's stateless. Right? So if you deploy an application on it, that application cannot write. Well, it can write to local storage. But remember, local storage gets blown away. Right? So it is a stateless virtual machine. And you think, okay, well, in that case, what's the point of it? 
Um, well, and, and also, what operating system can you run in, in a VM role? And it was it's Windows 2008 R2. All right. So that this is just remember that one today. All right. Um, it's if you go for a VM role, you're responsible for your operating system, your operating system updates, and so on. So what you re you do is you create a uh, a VM role, right? VHD. You deploy the VHD up into the, the cloud, and then if you once you deployed it up into the cloud, if you want to do updates, you effectively on your VHD here you create a differencing disk. You do the updates onto your differencing disk, and then you deploy the differencing disk up into the cloud. So that's how how you actually maintain it. So what does it exist at all? Um, it's when your application requires a long install time. So what's happening is your apps is basically being installed when this. So if you if you say let's put an app up into the cloud, right? So what happens is Microsoft gives you a virtual machine, right, and the application gets installed on it. So that takes a long time, then you could deploy it as a VM role and already pre-put the application on. If you have an application that couldn't be automated its deployment, you could use it for that, so legacy applications. So there's a number of times you'd want to use it, but watch out for June 2012, and you will see some fairly major changes around the Azure platform. And particularly, one of the changes is going to be a persistent VM role. And once you've got a persistent VM role, you could put SharePoint in the cloud. You could put legacy apps with no change in the cloud. Right? Today, if you've got an application, it's really got to be rewritten to run in Azure. But once you've got a persistent VM role, the changes are very, very significant in terms of what you can do. In terms of storage, um, you've got local storage, can be allocated per instance, however, it should only be used for caching because it is not persistent. You've then got persistent, we've got, we've seen the tables, we've seen the queues, you've got SQL uh, here, and you've got blobs, and as I say, just think of a blob, it's, it's, blob storage is just like a file system. So in terms of storage access, it's all done through, uh, all via access is via URLs, and um, the the requests are signed with a storage key. So what you could do, in fact, in blob storage, is you can declare a folder as being public, so anyone can get to it. But normally they're private, and you need the storage key to gain access. But it means that because it's URL based, you can actually get to storage from anywhere. So what I could do is I could have storage in the cloud, which I've got on-premise app that's actually gaining access to it. I could have SQL in the cloud. I can have my on-premise app connected to SQL in the cloud. I, equally well, I could replicate from SQL in the cloud to on-prem SQL as well. So I've got lots of, lots of options there. And a very useful little tool is the, the Azure Storage Explorer. So how do we deal with that? Very, very easy. All right. You now know that your ticket sales open on Monday, so I wouldn't scale it up Monday morning. I'd probably scale it up over the weekend, do some testing, and know that you got there. So you can overscale if need be. It's not going to cost you a lot. And once you see what the, the peak of your demands got to, you can start scaling down. So rather than, I've got this ready as a sort of bang, bang sort of control algorithm, but you scale up to something that you predict, and then you could step it down over time. And in this way, you don't have any of those career limiting moments because you know your capacity, you've got full agility over what you're providing as a service. In terms of hosting the service, the service is hosted somewhere in the world. Right? You don't have an awful lot of control of it, you, well, but you, you have regional control over it. So I could host the service anywhere in the US, uh, in fact, uh, I should have re recaptured the screenshot. I I'll show you this in a moment. Um, we'll actually go up onto the portal and look at it. So we've we got a little bit more classification on here, but I can go Northern Europe, Western Europe, etc. So this is the, the hosted, where the service is hosted. Um, what you probably don't want to do is you say anywhere in Europe and uh, something's hosted here and your storage is hosted here. 
So what you do is you create an affinity group. And an affinity group doesn't control where it's hosted, in which data center, but it means that everything has an affinity to stay together. Right? So if you deploy your storage and your sort of front end systems will be in the same location, the same data center. Uh, if you look at that and say, here, hang on a minute, because of regulations, we cannot put some of our data into the cloud. Right? What you could do is you could have your front ends actually connecting back to on-prem data. So you, you could handle it that way as well. In terms of application deployment, um, if the application deployment itself, they're specifically developed for Windows Azure. They say you, you can do sort of leg legacy apps in VM roles, but uh, you really, you, uh, if possible, you want to develop the app for the Azure itself. Uh, you can run the Windows Azure in a development environment, so you've got that capability for testing, but you can't actually deploy and run them on-premise. So I can't take an Azure app, run it on-premise in a production environment. So in terms of creating the service, what you need to do is you've got binaries. Okay, and if you like, you can think of them almost, they've, they've got to install very, very quickly, the binaries. So web roles and worker roles are effectively dynamic link libraries. So Microsoft spin up a VM for you, dump the dynamic link libraries on there, and off you go. So that's your instance running. Uh, we've also got the, the ability to create the VHDs as well. You then have a definition file, and the definition file, for instance, in here, just bring up the mouse, the, with the VM size, small. So I've chosen a small VM size. I, I want to run diagnostics on here. I want to run remote access as well. And then what you have is a configuration file. And in the configuration file, you've got the number of instances. So you deploy that. The binaries, the definition file, if you want to change those guys, it's got to be redeployed. In the configuration file, you can change up on the, the Azure platform itself. And here, we've actually got, um, it's, it's actually, it's got the uh, default endpoint protocols and things. So there's, there's various things that you can actually change up in the cloud itself. So what you end up with is your developers, instead of giving you a nice MSI to install, right, what they'll do is they will give you a configuration file and also the, the actual package file. So you've got the package and the configuration. And they can deploy it. They can deploy it directly from Visual Studio. Or they'll give it to you, and then you deploy it. How do you deploy it? Either through PowerShell or actually going up onto the Azure portal. Right? And if you re need to redeploy when you're doing an upgrade, then you can resupply the package. If you want, you can just update the configuration file. So the service, it gets, first of all, deployed up into the portal. So you develop it, you package it, and it goes up into the portal itself into what's referred to as the RDFE. And as I say, you can put, put it into the RDFE through the, the actual Azure portal itself or through PowerShell. RDFE, anyone know what it is? Anyone remember the code name for Azure? Red dog, well done. Red, it's the red dog front end. And if you, if you look at processes running and things, you will see reference to red dog. So and you think, what on earth is red dog doing up there? And it was the, the red dog front end. And, and there's lots of stories about how it got called the red dog. And, and one of them is that the, the, the team was driving past a interesting uh, bar in San Diego. Uh, which was called the Pink Poodle. And they said, oh, that's a good name for the project. And people said, no, we can't call it the Pink Poodle. So it became the Red Dog. But I don't know how true that story is. <laughs> so it goes up there. And in there, remember, you're defining your instance size. You're defining the number of instances you want, the endpoints, and so on. So what happens now is the, the fabric controller click, kicks into life, right? You have no control over the fabric controller. And the fabric controller looks at the data center and says, OK, what we can do is we can, uh, we can put your instances here, 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 and here. 
right? And then what we'll do is these are in front, these guys are web roles, so we'll put them through the load balancer and give them a public IP. So now we've got public IP to our two front ends and then the, the worker roles are sitting in the, in the back end. So they're allocated across systems right, as virtual machines. They are actual virtual machines themselves. The, we've got the, this concept of what we call update and fault domains. So uh, <coughs> we have multiple update domains, which means that when we come to doing updates, we can update each domain individually. Right? You can get Azure to do it automatically, in which case it will update one update domain and then another one and then another one, which means your service keeps running during an update. Right? You may find that if you update, if, you, if it's uh, you know, the front end service and you update the home page, right, through the load balancer, some people will be coming to the new home page while others are going to the old. Right? But it means your service keeps running, and then eventually everyone will be coming to the, the new front end. To go along with that, we also have the, the concept of fault domains. Um, and in terms of a, 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 a fault domain, right, you have no control over update domains. You can control how the updates happen. With fault domains, it's purely a data center thing. So a fault domain means that this is a single point of failure, potentially. This is a single point of failure. This is a single point of failure. And actually, it sort of really is associated with a rack. So you have a rack, you have the blades in the rack, and then you have your switch at the top, you've got your power coming in the bottom. Potentially, that could die as a single point of failure. Right? So when you deploy your two instances, one will go in one fault domain, and another will go in another fault domain. So if one goes down, right, you'll still keep running. You may be reduced capacity, but you're still running. And you know, but but you'll be. It's the reduced capacity is only for a very short period of time, as they move your instances to a new domain. All right. The the problem is when they move them, they're going to effectively re-image virtual machines for you. So remember, any data that you stored here has gone. And then. We've got this concept of staging and production. So when you create a hosted service, what you end up with is you end up with a production area and a staging area. And you can just do a straightforward VIP swap. So you can have something running in production, everyone's getting access to it, and then you can bring something up into staging. When they go into production, you get a, a, a well-defined URL. Right? When you're in staging, it's a GUID at the front of the URL. So people can't easily find it, right? So you're, you're going to your staging area. You could do your testing on your staging area. And when you're ready, you simply do a VIP swap, which swaps your production and staging across. So what I want to do is actually take us through the process. Um, and what I highly recommend with this is, is you get to talk to your dev guys, right? Get them to, there's lots of examples of how to build an Azure app. Get, get yourself an Azure app, which has, you can deploy it up into Azure, and then you can start to see how you can actually monitor the thing, how you can control it, put it between staging areas, and so on. And it's very important. I mean, at the moment, you know, so today, quite often the devs sort of work pretty much on their own, but this is very much a collaborative effort. So. What I want to do is actually, first of all, I'm going to actually go to Visual Studio. And uh, in the Visual Studio, you have a debug environment, so they can do, they can do de debugging, and there's a sort of Azure emulator. But in this thing, I've, I've got an example here. I've got a web role, and down here, I've got a worker role. So this is a web role and a worker role. Right? And up in the, we've got the, the definition files here. So if I just double click on that, well, in fact, um, let's actually not do that first. Let's have a look at the, the, this one here, the cloud configuration file. 
this is sort of standard XML. XML. You've actually got the, the number of instances defined there. And if I look in my def file, what you see is the actual VM size. So I'm using small, and in the configuration file, I'm using two instances. Right? And, and that's what I've decided is the, the how I'm going to deploy this thing. Uh, there is a rather more or easier interface to use, so we can see two instances, small, and you can choose extra large, large, medium, etc. So when it comes to time to, uh, they've done their testing and they're ready now to package this thing, um, they simply go package, and what the package will do is they, uh, it's cloud and it's release, and it's going to come up with the two files that we want to deploy up into the cloud. And, and obviously, during their testing, they'll be loading these packages up themselves, the dev. But when it comes over to a production service, then if you're going to do an upgrade, then what you'll want is to, up, is to load the package into the staging area, do the testing you want to do on it, and then uh, go from there. So this has created me the, the CSPG there, which is the, and, and the service configuration there. So the, this is the configuration file, which is quite small. This is effectively a cab file. All the binaries in there, and the definition file is in there as well. During, during the development phase, um, the developers can much simply, from Visual Studio, simply go publish. And what it will do is it will, we're, gonna, we're going to uh, target the profile in here, and we decide it's a hosted service, service one, going into the staging environment. It's using a storage account, which is called XTS Storage in here, and so on. So let's go over to the portal, and if we look at the, the portal itself, and there's a home page, lots of information on the home page in terms of getting started. If, if you're a bit of a developer and you've done some development, there's some very easy examples you can look at. You will need Visual Studio to do it. Otherwise, work with somebody in your development team just to create you a package that you can deploy. So if we look at this, what we've got is, if we look under hosted services, um, what I can see in here is I've actually got a hosted service up there. And let me just drag this down if I can, which it doesn't seem to want to do. Okay, so first of all, affinity groups. Uh, I've created an affinity group called Europe, and that's where I'm deploying. So I've deployed my storage and my service into that affinity group. If you want to create a new affinity group, you just go new affinity group, and you give it a name. Um, and uh, I don't know, what should we call it, Fred, that might work. Um, and you, the, in terms of, uh, as I said, I should have recaptured this screen um, for, because we've got a little bit more control as to where we place the stuff in the US. So remember, the affinity group is just going to, those two guys are going to have affinity to stay together, but it's going to be somewhere in Europe. Okay. Um, next thing is if we actually look at the, we go down and we look at the hosted services, what I can see in here is I've got this example one service, it's hosted, I've got uh, in terms of my, I've got a worker role and a web role, and I've got two instances running of each. If I select this, um, this guy is actually sitting and, trouble this with the screen resolution, it's sitting in staging. So I've got this rel rather wacky URL to get to it. So I can go over to my, this is my little application sitting in the cloud, pulls the server name. Uh, obviously, you don't need to know that. Uh, it's got the, the uh, uh, role name and the role instance. So this is instance one of this particular role. It's sitting in fault domain one and update domain one. And if I just do a, Whoops, there it is. It changed the server name, so now it's sitting on a different server, different fault domain. So that's the other instance there. So I just, just by refreshing, I switched over on the load balancer and ended up on, on the other one. Um, I've got a, it's a very simple sort of demonstration program, and I can browse. So I've got blob storage, and I think I've got some blobs here. Where did I put them? Um, blobs, there you go. There's a blob. So I can upload a blob. 
And that blob is now actually uploaded. I can also get to it directly if it's in, it happens to have actually gone into public storage. So I can actually get to it directly with this URL. Um, if I go to uh, tables, um, again, this is a very, very simple demo. I'm just adding it into a table. And so and now, so having added it into the table, I'm just accessing the table storage from here. And I'm just going to drop 20 messages into my message queue and send them on the way. And you think blobs, you know, queues, tables, can I access them? And absolutely you can. So if you use something like Azure, um, the storage explorer, um, I can actually look at my images here, and my blobs. And there's my blob I just uploaded. So it's the blob storage. And I'm, I'm not going through the Azure portal or anything else. I'm connecting directly up through the Azure APIs to gain access. Uh, if I want to look at my table, I can. So uh, please choose a table to query. So and query that guy. And I've got the two entries I put in there. And if I look at my queues, and again, if I uh, have a look inside the queue, if look inside the order queue, I put 20 items in the queue, but there are only 10 left. And if I do a refresh on them, now there are eight, and it will gradually go down until there's nothing left in the queue. And the reason being is my compute, all right, my worker role is looking in the queue, and actually every 10 seconds, the worker roles are pulling out of the queue. And, and working on those. So there, it's just a, a sort of demo of the sort of queues and tables. Right, so let's go back to the portal itself. And um, so we go back to the, the management portal. And let's look. So in terms of hosted services, I only have one. If I wanted to create a new one, I could go new hosted service. And I give it a name. I choose a region or I choose an affinity group, and then I can decide to, at that point, I can put a package in and a configuration file and deploy it up there. And I can choose whether I deploy it into production or into staging, all right? because at this stage, all right, it's a new service. It's a new service ready to host an application, and I have both the production and the staging available to me. Um, if I if I just uh, let's just cancel that out. Um, if I go, I've currently got staging. I can go for a new production deployment. It knows I'm using staging. So service one, I can push something into production. Um, if I want to upgrade, I can actually upgrade this guy. So again, we can upgrade something that's running. Um, in terms of configuration, I can change in here. I can actually. In terms of the configuration, I can actually change the instance count. So if I wanted, say, suddenly to turn that into four instances, I can do it through here. Uh, the problem is if you do it through here, of course, the configuration file is not being maintained on premise. And it's a good idea to change your configuration file on premise and upload it, or to drive it through PowerShell and do, do your in, increase your number of instances through PowerShell. Um, I can stop. Um, I can, uh, if you remember, if you stop, you're still being charged. I can delete it. I can swap the, uh, the VIPs as well through this. Or I could re-image. If I decide to re-image, re uh, it does give you a warning that any data not uh, on the resource drive will, will be lost. So remember the, the non-persistent aspect of that. Um, so gives you a, a little bit of an idea of, of uh, how we control it through here. If you want to go up onto, uh, let's just go up into my web role, uh, I can use an RDP to the web, web role. So everything we know and love about the remote desktop is still available to us. So I'm connecting now with RDP up into one uh, web role instance in the cloud, and um, you know it's it's everything you, you expect from from RDP. Um, one thing you'll notice it's this is uh, 
it, the Windows is not genuine. Uh, this is because it's not it's not activated. You don't activate this thing in the cloud. That's all handled by Azure for you. But I mean, if you if you want to look at um, I remember I, I just logged on as Tom, and what's actually happened is it's actually, if we look under the configuration, uh, you'll see, you know, there's nothing magical about RDP. Tom exists, right? And actually, I created a password word for Tom, which was encrypted with a certificate, which was and then loaded up into here. So the password actually came up, and when the, the the VM was started, an account for Tom was created, the password was set, and the encrypted password had gone up into the cloud. If we look at the storage, what you'll find is you've got three drives. One, one drive is your caching drive, where your resources are stored. We've got another drive, which is the Windows drive, which is where Windows is itself. And the last drive is your deployment drive. So on here, I have an app root. Remember, this is my web front end. And I've, what I've done is actually, when I deployed the application, I had a, a utilities or my utilities directory. So you can put all your favorite tools up there and you can run your, your favorite tools and processor explorer and everything else. Uh, of course, event viewer, you can look at. Problem is, if you're looking at event viewer and you've got multiple instances running, then you'd have to go across multiple instances. So what you can do is you can collect and actually collect the, all the web logs, the event viewer logs and everything else into Azure storage, and then you can access that from on-premise. Uh, you can also set up all your performance counters. All the performance da counter data is also available to you. So when you when you look at this, you know, think about how do I monitor today my environment, make sure it's healthy and it's working. You do exactly the same with the application running up in Azure. It's just slightly different tools to get there and to manage that. Okay. So let's just go back to the slides. Oh, I, I'm up in the up in there, aren't I? So let's just go back to the PowerPoint. Um, and just in case I hadn't got a connection, I actually embedded the video in the. Go on, let's get past it. Um, just just in case there was no, I've been caught before with no internet connection, so I actually had an embedded video with that demo. Um, so in terms of connecting distributed systems, um, one of the things is, is you've got the Xeo service bus. And the great thing about this is that we can connect distributed systems together. It's all done through HTTPS. So it's likely that if you've got a point of sale terminal at a store somewhere, you have an HTTPS connection going out. Right? And, and therefore, you don't have to fiddle around with firewall rules or anything else. You can simply connect into the Azure service bus, and something somewhere else in some other cloud can also connect into the Azure service bus and consume information from that bus. And so you can actually have multiple sort of connection points coming in, and they're all communicating over the service bus. You can also uh, create yourself Azure Connect. And with Azure Connect, it's effectively a VPN into Azure. So what we can have is we can have on-premise machines, which are designated as connected to the virtual network. You can have a developer who you allow to work from home, maybe, or in his own office, connected onto the virtual network. And then you can connect up to your roles within Azure. So we can connect directly. This gives us the opportunity, of course, is for the role to directly connect down to on-premise and consume data from on-premise. So we can go obviously go in both directions with this. And in terms of actually setting this up, um, the, you activate Azure Connect. That's number one. And having done that, you actually set it up so that you defi define uh, in the configuration and definition files, we need to set up that we're going to use it. There's a connection ID. Where do you get that from? Well, when you activate it, you get that connection ID. You then need to, for the on-premise machines that need to connect, you need to install the, um, the endpoint software. And again, you can do that through the management portal. And then you create an endpoint group. 
and add the activated roles and computers to enable the connectivity. So what you've done is you've activated this thing in the cloud, you've activated this thing in the cloud, you've activated these machines on premise, right? They're all available, ready to use as Zero Connect. And what we do is we create a group and say, connect these guys to these guys, right? So that's um, it's it's done. It's all done through IPsec and IPv6. And it's obviously all tunneled so through IPv4. So here, you create the group. So it's the list of computer endpoints. Endpoints are these guys on premise, because you install the endpoint software on them. So we could have you know, half a dozen machines on here. We could have that developer out here who's installed the endpoint software as well. So having, having got that working, you then specify the Azure roles and uh, groups you connect to. Uh, this thing here, allow connections between endpoints in a group, would mean that you can actually have these guys talking to each other through Azure Connect. Be careful with that one. Um, I, I've uh, had an a organization that was using Azure Connect, and everything was working beautifully until they installed it. So we had, we had over here, let's say it was a client machine connecting to a database server over there. All right? And this was Windows 7. That was 2008 R2. And all connectivity was fantastic. Azure Connect got installed here. Azure Connect got installed there. And suddenly, the connectivity between here and here on premise became really, really slow. And the reason being? Yeah. Why? Because they have a preference to use IPv6. Right? So um, that's, that's, you need to be very, very careful if you actually tick that box. Because it means that if you've got, you know, you, you may find that systems are talking like this because they love IPv6 over IPv4. So suddenly you've got two machines next to each other and they're actually going up there to communicate. <laughs> so. Be, be careful of that tick box. Uh, you can also do domain join. So we can actually domain join Azure roles as well. And uh, through w when, when we actually set up Azure Connect, we can specify that we want these guys domain joined. Um, and what you'll need if you're going to do that is you will need a DC that has Azure Connect on it, and you'll need a DNS server that has Azure Connect. If you're running Active Directory integrated DNS, then it's just the DC. And that's, that's our, our DCs. Well, you need, obviously, at least one DC to do that. And I'm not going to have time to do this demo. I was going to do a quick demo of Azure Connect. So this is my list from before. So what do, what do we do now? Um, well, we no longer install server hardware. Okay, So the gentleman at the very back is going to be very upset with that one. <laughs> Um, you can still configure the network. So you configure the network now, and what we're doing is we're doing cloud on-premise connectivity as well. It's all the OS. No. Update, update, update. No. Right? Unless, of course, you use a VM role, and then you'll still be doing that. Um, and so managed storage and backup, absolutely. So blob storage, replicated three times, right? Bang, one disappears. It's still there, and up, up you're running with your same blob storage. You go in and delete all your blobs, tough. <laughs> right? So if you're, if you're going to protect against that, you drop a SQL database table. It's gone. Right? So what's happening is the integrity of your data is maintained against hardware failure, but not against human intervention. Um, in terms of uh, you know, the applying security, yes, certificates. So lots of certificates involved. You still need to do all your certificate management. Deploy applications. Yeah, when the devs are doing their testing, they can deploy very easily into the Azure cloud, but not into your production Azure cloud. You want to look after that. So you're going to be still doing that. Monitoring application OS and health and performance, absolutely. And matching the business requirements, again, managing demand and being agile. Now you've got the real potential for doing that. So what it is, it's just really, it's the same old job, but we're just using new tools and new techniques for actually dealing with it. But what it does do is it brings you 
the capability of being the expert at being agile. So you can be sitting in a meeting now and say, yeah, we can scale that up. I'll have it running for you tomorrow. And they all go, wow, amazing. Because you know, normally, it's, I, I've seen it so many times, you know, when somebody, you, you've got a, maybe, maybe the, the IT director is in a meeting and somebody says, we need to do this. And he goes, that's going to take a long time. All right, but now you've got real capability of doing it really quickly. The other thing to think about is, you know those things you've been thinking about, right? Uh, this, is, this is now, it's a, this is just perfect. After the time down the pub, you know, you've been drinking lots of beer and you come up with this amazing idea. But, you know, if you're going to put it as a public presence, it would take you forever to do it. All right, but now you've got the capability of doing this really very quickly. All right, so the services that you currently have on-prem, could they benefit from being in the cloud? Could you sell them to somewhere else? So it actually op potentially opens you with a huge marketplace. If you suddenly do a fantastic sushi selling website and you think, that ought to be in Japan, Japan, you deploy it right out in the Far East. So it's available to the customers out there. So a huge amount of potential, a lot of ways of, of thinking about it. And um, that actually brings me to the end of this session. Um, I'm going to be talking about sort of federation, federated identity at uh, TechEd. So anyone going to planning to be in TechEd? No one at the moment? Okay, well, it's on Orlando. It should be nice and warm in uh, June. Um, Amsterdam, not sure it'll be so warm, but it is June in Amsterdam. Anyway, so uh, that, that's, uh, that's what I will be doing in June time frame. And uh, if you've got any questions, by all means, come down and ask. Um, but we're sort of running a minute and a half over time, so I need to wind the session up for now. So thanks for coming along anyway. Thank you.